Tis the season, right? Tis the season right now. We've already passed the 25th in our winter month of, uh, of Kislev, when Hanukkah began. We all know that another holy day is coming soon. And soon it's going to be the 25th of December, one of our most sacred days of the year. Everyone knows what holiday is on the 25th? Shabbat! Right? The 25th is Shabbat. It's Friday. It's Friday. We all get to greet the visitor that comes. We get to sing L'chadodi L'ikrat Kawa. We get to visit the Shabbat bride who's going to come visit us on the 25th of December. Don't you just love Shabbat? (laughs) So another reason that the 25th is going to be special for my son this year um, is because uh, everyone knows we have our Shin Shinim program. We have the uh, two Israeli teens who come and visit us, uh, spend a year with us, um, and they get to spend the 25th with their families uh, because they take this pe- period in our calendar to go back to spend time with their loved ones. But before they left, they came into the junior kindergarten classroom here at Holy Blossom where my son is a student. And uh, this is what my son tells of their visit. He says that in class they asked him to write notes, to write, uh, in fact, a list of things that he wanted. A list of presents. And the Shin Shinim, when they fly back to Israel, are going to take these notes and they're going to fold them up and place them in the Kotel, in the Western Wall. And the Kotel, of course, being where God lives, right? And when God gets that note, God then travels from the Kotel to every home on Hanukkah. (laughs) But only actually to the homes of the good Jewish boys and girls. Because he knows that if he wants that Lego city block... He said he wants the whole block of Lego City, which I think is something in the $300 range, just last time when I looked. (laughs) If he wants that block, and and he knows he will will get that block, in fact, if he is good. (laughs) And only if he is good. So he said, Daddy, I'm going to be good so I can get that whole Lego City block. (laughs) He's not going to get the Lego City block. Yeah, he got a dollar store coloring book, he, which he loved, which he did love. Um, I'm not sure anyone else caught it, but when I heard this story, I was thinking, oh, the Shinshinim are teaching that the Kotel is Santa Claus. <laughs> I talked to the Shinshinim about this. They swear six ways to Sunday, not, not their words, um, that this isn't exactly what they were trying to teach. <laughs> Rather that if you work for something or wish for it really hard and really put effort into it and through your hard work, then you can earn things. And I said, what work is my son going to do right now where he can afford <laughs> that Lego City block? It's possible that my son did absorb this from being a little boy in Canada today, watching the Christmas edition of Paw Patrol, which he again watched this morning, because he requested the Halloween edition, it was the one right after. Or the Cat in the Hat Christmas episode. Maybe these things put it in his mind. And what the Shinshinim did is they put a nice Jewish narrative that he could hang the Santa Claus scaffolding around. But there really is some interesting theology here that is worth unpacking a little bit. Number one, good things, presents, come only to good boys and girls. Number two, God lives at the Kotel. And number three, which was the Shinshinim's last comment, which if if you work really hard, and if you wish really hard for something... 
it will come true. If we don't believe this, if we don't believe that if you wish really hard for it, then what is prayer? And what are we all doing here today? So first, good things come to good people. This was, in fact, a core piece of Jewish theology for generations. Sacharva Onesh, reward and punishment. In fact, if you open up our prayer book, which you are welcome to, but by no means are required to this moment, because I'll read it for you anyway, um, on to page 171, you'll see a section of the service that we kind of did, but we kind of didn't do. Um, and this is the Ve'ahavta, right? You, uh, you, you would have seen in the prayer book, in bold, it says, Shema Yisrael, and then in a script with different marks around it, because it comes from the Torah, right, in cantillation marks, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. And then those of us under the age of 60, or those over with good, strong glasses, can see here on the page that there is the really tiny text that's there because we kind of want you to know it exists, but we don't really want you to read it. <laughs> if you carefully obey my mitzvot, which I give you this day, to love and serve Adonai your God with all your heart and soul, I will then cause rain to fall on your land in season, the autumn rains and the spring rains, that you may gather in your grain, wine, and oil. And if you obey my laws, I will provide grass in your fields for your cattle, that you will eat and be satisfied. Lest, beware, beware, lest your heart be deceived and you turn and serve other gods and bow down to them. For then the anger of the Eternal One will blaze against you and will shut up the sky so there will be no rain and the land will yield no produce and you will quickly vanish from the good land which the Eternal One gives you. Therefore, of course, um, Laman, therefore you shall remember to do the mitzvot, right? Remember to do them. We, we picked up with that part. That's bold again. Laman tiskeru vasitam, right? So this is, in fact, in our, in, in our sacred text, this idea of good things coming into good people, rain and life and happiness. Um, but if you walk away from God, right, there will be no rain and the land will not produce. In the modern world and the way that we think about things today, um, there are still some who believe this and hold it dear in their hearts and it's a core piece of their Judaism. And if that's you, that is fine. But for many of us, interpretations like this work better. This is from um, Mishkan Tefillah, which is the reform prayer book used by most congregations around the world. Um, and it has these alternative readings in them, kind of like our does on the margins or on the side. This is one of those um, alternative readings. By the way, included in these readings, a side note, is a, a poem by Adam Saul, Rabbi Splansky's husband. This one's not by him, but he, in fact, is in the prayer book that every other reform synagogue around the world uses. He has stuff in ours, too, but it's not the... the <laughs> I mean, the editor maybe didn't want to show too much favoritism towards her husband. But. If we can hear the words from Sinai, then love will flow from us, and we shall serve all that is holy with all our intellect and all our passion and all our life. If we can serve all that is holy, we shall be doing all that humans can to help the rains to flow, the grasses to be green, the grains to be golden like the sun, and the rivers to be filled with life once more. All the children of God shall eat, and there will be enough. But if we turn from Sinai's words and serve only what is common and profane, making gods of our own comfort or power, then the holiness of life will contract for us. Our world will grow inhospitable. Therefore, let us lace these words into our passion and our intellect and bind them as a sign upon our hands and eyes. Let us write them in mezuzot upon our doors and teach them to our children. Let us honor the generations that came before us, keeping the promise for those yet to be. Right? If we can hear the words, then love will flow from us into the world. Right? Are the rich rich 
because they are more good than others, the poor because they are less good in a moral sense. The cycle of poverty and disadvantage, inherited wealth and advantage, show that this, in many cases, is just not true. We admit now to the existence of the great theological force in the world that we sometimes call luck. That many are good not for reward, not, many of us are good and act with good intentions not for the reward, but because being a good person in this world is its own reward, reward. This goodness, this goodness brings God into our world, making the world closer to divine, rather than being held up as a bribe or a gift, if only we were to behave. Number two, God lives at the Kotel. So, in Judaism, we do face east in prayer, unless we are at Holy Blossom Temple. Then the rabbi face east. Why is this? This is because the Kotel, the temple in Jerusalem, has been at the heart of our people for many years. Um, since our religion had founded that home in Jerusalem at the Holy Temple. Yet, we know, of course, that God is everywhere. When the Hasidim talked about returning to Jerusalem, they weren't actually talking about a physical place. In fact, it's, it's awkward in some Israeli museums, in, uh, I believe it was Totsafot, uh, in the Museum of the Dispersion, um, there's a quote by, I believe it's Nachman or Bretzlov, saying, um, we all must return to Jerusalem. But what he's saying is that there's a place in each of our hearts that we can make whole and pure, and if only we can reach that place, that Jerusalem, then the world will be a better place and we ourselves will be better people. Right? So we, of course, know that in Jewish theology, God, God lives everywhere and God is everywhere. And in fact, if you were to have read the uh, New York section of the New York Times um, yesterday, I believe, my mother pointed out to me. Um, this is a newspaper clip from 1844. The sterling old Dutchman, Santa Claus, has just arrived from the renowned regions of Manhattan with his unusual budget of knickknacks for Christmas times. So in the 1800s, Santa Claus lived in Manhattan. Um, apparently, the whole Santa Claus thing is from an 1822 poem written by a New Yorker. Um, and eventually, Santa Claus migrated north to the, to the North Pole, right? Um, but even Santa Claus doesn't live in, uh, in one place. So, uh, so God, we can say, um, being everywhere, but especially in the language of this poem from Mishkan Tefillah, right, the love will flow from us. Um, we can find the divine when we look deep inside of ourselves and find our own Jerusalem. And third, prayer. The Shinshinim's comment that they have to work for it or wish for it hard enough. If this isn't true, then what is the purpose of prayer? Or Torah, a Hasidic commentator as well, discusses our Torah portion, where Judah approaches Joseph. We talked about it in the Torah study um, this morning, this moment when Joseph comes to, when Judah comes before Joseph, and he says, Adoni, and he's talking both to Joseph and, in the, in, according to Or Torah, also to God. Or Torah writes, Shechina requires our voice. We give her the words to pray for the world to be healed. Our own unfulfilled needs, both spiritual and physical, are part of the fracture. Through the act of prayer, we open ourselves up and allow God to speak through us. And in this mystical moment, our voice allows the divine element within us to call out to the infinite one above. So for Orha Torah, what is prayer? True prayer, true longing is saying, God, look, there is brokenness in the world. We have wants, we have needs. There are those that are in need of healing. And therefore, God, the words I am saying, because you are everywhere and even inside of me, are the words that you are saying to heal the fractures in our world, to make our world now more complete. So when we look at prayer, 
in this way. Of course, prayer isn't that list of presents that our children write at the Kotel now, apparently, in our junior kindergarten classes. Prayer is about the inner things that we're looking for and looking to have fulfill us in our world. And these prayers ask for, through love, our desires to be fulfilled, through the mercy um, in our world, hoping that capriciousness does not rule, that love can supersede luck. God, therefore, is in the goodness that we hope for in our world and that we bring to our world. God is the love that parents show to children when children are good or bad. God is the love that parents show to children just because they are children. As we say, Avinu Malkeinu, we have a Father in Heaven, and when we look at how do we love the Lord our God, the rabbis say the way that we love our God is through our love of our parents, right? Parents model the behavior that we expect God to have in this world, and therefore we know parents love no matter how we act and forgive even when we feel we are past the point of forgiving. So in this time of winter, this time it's just starting to get cold, I can even feel it inside these days. <laughs> As we reach towards next Shabbat, we know that our children will be filled with gifts of love, of warmth, and of closeness. The gift of Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom.